spoke to me um, uh, probably for about the past month now to uh, get to know Psalm 91 uh, and to get under the shelter of the Almighty and to find that secret place and to be in peace, to guard my peace. And so that's what I'm going to share with you today. And so I'd like uh, to read from the Passion Translation, uh, Psalm 91, because I, I thought, well, it's so good in the regular King James, but I'd like to uh, just put it into a more contemporary speech type of uh, setting for people that might not read the Bible. This will be easier for you to understand. It says, when you sit enthroned under the shadow of Shaddai, that means God, you are hidden in the strength of God Most High. He's the hope that holds me and the stronghold to shelter me, the only God for me and my great confidence. He will rescue you from every hidden trap of the enemy, and he will protect you from false accusation and any deadly curse. His massive arms are wrapped around you, protecting you. You can run under his covering of majesty and hide. His arms of faithfulness are a shield, keeping you from harm. You will never worry about an attack of demonic forces at night, nor have a fear of spirit of darkness coming against you. Don't fear a thing. Whether by night or by day, demonic danger will not trouble you nor will the powers of evil launched against you. For God will keep you safe and secure. They won't lay a hand on you. Even in a time of disaster, with thousands and thousands being killed, you will remain unscathed and unharmed. You will be a spectator as the wicked perish in judgment, for they will be paid back for what they have done. When we live our lives within the shadow of the God Most High, our secret hiding place, we will always be shielded from harm. How then could evil prevail against us or disease infect us? God sends angels with special orders to protect you wherever you go, defending you from all harm. If you walk into a trap, They'll be there for you and keep you from stumbling. You will even walk unharmed among the fiercest powers of darkness, trampling every one of them beneath your feet. For here is what the Lord has spoken to me. Because you have delighted in me as my great lover, I will greatly protect you. I will set you in a high place, safe and secure before my face. I will answer your cry for help every time you pray. And you will find and feel my presence, even in your time of pressure and trouble. I will be your glorious hero and give you a feast. You will be satisfied with a full life and with all that I do for you, for you will enjoy the fullness of my salvation. Isn't that good? Oh, my gosh. God's love is for us all. Whether we are saved or unsaved, he's got us covered, no matter where in life we find ourselves. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. That's how easy it is to uh, become born again. The Bible says a lot about God's protection and dealing with fear that tries to come on us as children of God. Oh, and so I wanted to share with you Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2 and 4, if you want to turn there. It's really good. Isaiah 43. 
verses 1, 2, and 4. But now, thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. So no matter what your name is, God has called you by name. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. And verse 4 says, Since you were precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore, I will give men for thee and people for thy life. God will protect us. Once we're born again, we need to learn to abide in God's presence. And uh, you say, why do we need God's presence in our life all the time? Well, it's because Jesus prayed. He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So God wants us to live in heaven while we are on the earth. So um, how can we have God's presence here? Well, what we can do is we can praise him. There's praise and thanksgiving in heaven. So that's what we need to be doing here on earth. We need to realize in, uh, that God is a good God and give him honor. And read his word. We honor him by reading his word and by doing his word being obedient to his word and his Holy Spirit's leading so that we can stay in his presence. John 15, verses 7, 8, and 16, Jesus said, If you abide in me, my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples." You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And fruit in this reference is speaking about answered prayer. God wants to make sure that our prayers get answered. When things come against us, God's made provision through giving us armor. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 18, that says, uh, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, <clears throat> the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always, and with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching there too, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, <clears throat> not just the ones you like and you get along with. <laughs> it says for all the saints. <laughs> Boy, most of the time, uh, spiritual warfare is in our minds through doubt and unbelief and worries and cares and jealousy and feelings of inadequacy and inferiority and even hopelessness. So 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 6, God conquered that too. He told us, he said, for though we walk, in, well, 
the Apostle Paul was speaking, he said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That means we don't war after people. We don't go give them a piece of our mind. <laughs> Even though sometimes you got to bite your tongue. <laughs> you got to try so hard just to put that anger down. <laughs> and the Bible says, be angry and sin not. <laughs> the Bible, and, uh, uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having uh, in, which means within, a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So that means to, to uh, make yourself come into line with God's word, which sometimes we don't want to do. <laughs> God wants us to rest in him and to trust him to take care of us. Hebrews 4, verses 9, 11, and 12 says, There remains a rest to the people of God. Let us therefore labor or labor, therefore, to enter that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing aside, piercing even to the dividing aside, asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. To enter his rest, we need to have his peace. And that can be a challenge to hold on to peace when you are in a war or when you are in a battle. <clears throat> Isaiah 26, 1 says, You, speaking to God, says you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. We need to always try and make sure that we are putting our trust in God and not in our own selves and what we can do. <clears throat> so how do we get God's peace in our life? Well, Philippians 4, verses 4 to 8, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is available. We need to keep that in mind. The Lord is available. He's as close as our prayer life to him. We just need to ask him for help. The Bible says, be careful for nothing. So it says, be carefree. <laughs> but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's the anointed Jesus. The word Christ means anointed. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure or lovely, <clears throat> whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the peace of God shall be with you. That's how we get the peace of God. I want to share my niece's uh, testimony, my niece Sarah's testimony. I gave the, her testimony back a few years ago, four years ago now, uh, when it first happened, just after it had first happened. But I got it updated. I found out what has happened in the four years since this testimony. Now, um, her testimony begins here. <clears throat> I had asked her for an update. I texted her and asked her for an update. And the next thing I know, I've got great big <laughs> messages here and there following one after the other. I thought, oh, my goodness, I forgot. And whenever you talk to Sarah, it's just... <laughs> So anyways, I was going, oh my gosh, but it's such a fantastic testimony. I need to share it with you. Uh, 
uh, she said, Jesse, her husband, had left her, his daughter's 11th birthday party about 9 p.m. for a bike ride. They have three children at home. And she had had 10, around 10 girls sleeping over that night for a sleepover. So she had her other two kids plus <laughs> these 10 kids plus her daughter. So he had left the party at around 9 o'clock, went to go for a bike ride. Strangely enough, Sarah said that she woke up at 1.13 a.m. Sarah says, I woke up and realized that Jesse was not home. I messaged him right away. My message was left unread. Oddly, his accident happened at the exact same time, according to the witnesses and police. That's how good God is. He woke her up out of her sleep. And if you ever get woke up out of your sleep, pray. You never know who needs that prayer time from you. So um, God had alerted her through her waking her up from her sleep. And then the next thing she knew, the police were at her door uh, informing her that her husband had been in an accident. So she, um, she goes on to say, Jesse is doing amazing. He suffered traumatic brain injury from the accident. The police state that he fell asleep on the bike and something at the last moment woke him up just feet before hitting the hydro pole, which then prompted him to hit the brakes. He hit the brakes at the last second, causing the bike to slide on its side, hitting a hydro pole at over 200 kilometers per hour. And then the bike bounced back, slamming his body to hit into the front of a dumpster. His helmet was cracked where he suffered his brain injury. At the spot of his injury, the doctor said he would have memory loss. But when he was able to come to four days later, he remembered me and his long-term memory. He only suffered a little bit of short-term memory and the bulk of that was just the accident. He could not remember the accident. She said he has no problems at all with anything and no pain from any of it. Oh my gosh. This, uh, his accident was July 23rd of 2017. Both his lungs collapsed, and they put in drainage tubes to drain them. He was unconscious when I got to see him that day. Sarah's nurse friend told her later that they decided to let her see him before they cleaned him up. They just brought her in because they did not expect him to live uh, beyond a, a couple of hours. He was given less than 20% life expectancy at that time because he wasn't breathing on his own. Like, the magnitude of this miracle, it, it just baffles me. I, there's no other words for it. For three days from that time, they found he had 28 broken bones within his core. It was not until the fourth day that his body showed signs of life greater than 40%. Pastor Sean Sloan White, they live in Ontario, Pastor Sean Sloan White came straight from the airport to the hospital in Windsor to see us. I remember feeling that sense of comfort. When I saw him, <laughs> and she says, not to sound cheesy, but it was like a sign from God that I was not alone. Going to the hospital may be an inconvenience for people, but it can be a lifeline when people are facing trauma. Uh, she says, it told me that there was a higher presence now there for me to see. Uh, she said, he came into the ICU and he held my hand as he said a prayer over Jesse, who was still very touch and go. My gosh. 
I cannot explain the feeling, but his words of prayer gave me a calm feeling. See, that's the anointing of God that he brought with him, the peace that passes understanding. From that point, I was no longer scared. And that very evening, Jesse showed signs of breathing on his own. He was transferred the next day to extended care, then the next day to another floor. Jesse fell out of bed two times, which the nurse and doctor told me falls like that could have killed him because he had no rib cage left to, uh, in place to protect his vital organs. They did x-rays each time, and he was fine. Truly, he had the angels looking after them. After he fell out of bed the second time, they went and they put restraints on him <laughs> to keep him in bed. But he, when we were at the restaurant, he said that he just got the urge he had to go to the bathroom. So he'd, he'd get up to go to the bathroom and he forgot because he was so drugged up. <laughs> He forgot that he couldn't walk and that he had a busted hip. So the minute he put weight down, <laughs> he just collapsed on the floor because he had nothing to hold him up on the whole one side. He was just busted up totally. <laughs> she said uh, he had a broken hip, broken shoulder, 17 broken ribs, many fractures, 28 broken bones altogether. He could not walk, and I was told he would need many months of rehabilitation for his injuries. When we saw him a month later, when he was trying to walk, he, he was going like this <laughs> when he was walking, because there was nothing. I never realized hips must balance your legs out, because when he was walking, he, he was going like this, because there was no hip there to, <laughs> for him to walk with. It, it was the strangest thing to see him hobble. <laughs> so... Anyways, um, yeah, by the end of August, July 23rd was the accident. So by the end of August, he was well enough and stable enough to be discharged. <laughs> and uh, they made a stipulation. The physiotherapy people at the hospital told him, they said, uh, they asked him, how many uh, stairs do you have to get up into your house? And they said, five. They said, you have to be able to walk up five stairs before you can leave the hospital. And he was just that stubborn, and <laughs> that bound and determined to go home, that he was able to walk, broken hip, broken shoulder, <laughs> and he got up five steps, and they released him from the hospital only because of that. <laughs> My gosh. Uh, let's see, he had the doctors so puzzled. <laughs> He should have went to rehabilitation, but he wanted to come home to us. During his hospital stay, the Gospel Church, the same church where Pastor Sean presided at the time as youth pastor. Thank God for youth pastors. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Held Jesse and our family in prayers. See, at that time, our church and many friends of theirs, their churches and the family members and friends, Everybody was holding them up in prayer as a family. Sarah continues, the gospel church reached out and brought our children snacks. She was at the hospital most of the time, and she said that she was so torn in that time because she, felt she was torn. She needed to be with Jesse, but yet she had three children at home that needed to get cared for too. And so... Uh, the gospel church reached out and brought our children snacks. They checked in on them and brought them meals and offered to help in any way. At the time, Alyssa, her daughter, was still going to the youth program there, and they all made her very comfortable in deal with dealing through it. Uh, Sarah is uh, Catholic, and uh, so her daughter was going to this Baptist church youth group. So youth programs and churches are vital. I want to stress that. They are a lifeline and an anchor to people, to kids in the storms of life. By late August, Jesse came home a month later. Sarah says, I can remember meeting with you and Uncle Paul for dinner in Windsor. They met at a restaurant with us. I remember your prayers so strong and powerful. And while we prayed over Jesse at the restaurant, we encircled him, and we were just barely touching him because he was still all bruised up. 
uh, from the accident. And uh, so we were just very lightly touching him to pray over him. But uh, while we were praying, we had a, I know I had my eyes closed, but you could feel his t-shirt. All of a sudden, it was like a fluttering that was happening on his t-shirt. And anyways, I, look, I opened my eyes right away, and Paul said he felt it too. And there were some other people there that, that when we opened our eyes, we said, did you feel that? Because it was like his t-shirt was fluttering. I'd never felt anything like that before in my life. It was totally awesome. The power of God was just strong. And it was right in the middle of the restaurant, <laughs> you know, before everybody left. We wanted to make sure to pray over them. <laughs> uh, and so um, I personally believe that some of his bones were shifting back into place and that the cracked ribs were being healed where there was cracks and stuff. God was operating while we were praying over him. After our meal at the restaurant, I was again amazed. I think this was the most amazing thing to, uh, that I saw besides that. Um, he went and he walked over, he went while well, he hobbled over to the pickup truck. Uh, they had a cane for him, I think. And uh, anyways, he didn't want to use the cane. He wouldn't take the cane from Sarah. He was walking instead. So not even knowing it, like that's an act of faith where <laughs> he didn't want to use the cane. He was hobbling and <laughs> but he goes and he climbs up on the pickup truck like he had. He's a tandem truck driver. So he had this big 450 or 150 pickup truck with the extra big high wheels and stuff to make it all cool. And so he's, he's straddling this thing to get up in it. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, <laughs> how did he do that? I'm, I'm watching him with my eyes, but I, I can't believe it because he's totally busted up on the one side. <laughs> it just so amazed me. It was one of those things you can't believe your eyes. Like, what a miracle God had performed, you know. <laughs> so ironically... She says, uh, to go back to what she was saying, ironically, when Jesse and I talked about it later, when he was healing, he said he could remember having a decision to make in his head like a dream. It was his choice whether to stay or go. Almost like something greater was telling him what was happening. It's not something. When we thought about it, it was the same day that Pastor Sean had come to the hospital and said the prayer for him. Now see, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Thank God that Pastor Sean was in their lives, that he was right there, right close, and he made himself available to them to help them through that time. You know, um, you may not be clo in close proximity to your family, but God has you covered. He'll put people around, the people in your family that need help at the time. You know, Jesse said that he had decided to live because he couldn't leave this world without telling me that he loved me and to make sure that I knew he, that he loved me. Now, this was a guy that went to church only on Christmas Eve. <laughs> He did not earn God's mercies and his grace and his love, and neither can we, you know. And this is the good news. He couldn't earn it. God saved him even when he didn't ask for it, even when he wasn't living for God. You know, uh, Romans 5.8 says, God commends and demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 7.14 says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else where were your children unclean, but now they are holy. So we are called to stand in the gap for our unsaved loved one's salvation. Sarah says, 
continues, things I felt important from it all was that I can remember after the three days of being at the hospital, hearing words like DNR, asked about his religion in case of him needing his last rites. I remember feeling a comfort that kept me calm and focused, which allowed me to be there for him. I remember the first time days after when he finally opened his eyes and I smiled at him and held his hand and the word hi came from my lips. It was a feeling of overjoy, knowing in my heart that he would make it. Glory to God. She says, I remember having the words unconditional love flood my mind as I talked to our children about what was happening. That was the Holy Spirit's leading in her because she had a lot of forgiveness because <laughs> she, she was mad at him for, <laughs> for racing on the bike and for doing stupid things he did <laughs> and stuff. And so she had to get over that <laughs> as well as deal with him standing in the gap for him. So she had all this pressure coming against her. She was in a battle because she loved him, but she wanted to smack him. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So anyways, <laughs> there was lots of ups and downs through that time emotionally for all of us, for Jesse and our family. The meaning of that love and support, how love comes above all in a moment like this, having faith will heal not only Jesse, but us and our family. See, that's just ingrained that faith in God in her so much more. As a family, we struggled to help him, to understand it, but somehow we all found our ways to show unconditional love and support for him and each other, helping one another through it. Over those next few months, Jesse continued to heal very quickly, and by February of 2018, that's seven months after this accident. By February 2018, he was whole and ready to go back to work transport driving. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> I will never forget the prayer that day that Pastor Sean prayed. He not only prayed for Jesse and his words, but he asked God to look after our family and to give us peace, whatever it may be, and guide us. And I remember those words, and I know that it might not sound like much, but at that particular time, and still to this day inside, I can feel that, and it helped us and our family tremendously. Today, he is doing well, like nothing has happened in the short story. <laughs> and then she puts laugh out loud. <laughs> All oh, praise to God. So I was being nosy and curious, and I asked Sarah if Jesse still has his pouch of bone shards, because right here he had like a, it was like a, a flap of skin. <laughs> and she said that that's where all the bones, the broken ribs and that had, th like he had bone shards. You know how pointed bones can be uh, that were, that had from him being crushed <laughs> against that uh, thing and uh, that Biffy container. And anyways, uh, she said, uh, let's see, I've got to find my spot. Yeah, he, he has, she said he has, um, let's see. She says, there was no signs of any damage except his back still to this day looks like a wave under the skin from the ribs being misplaced. His hip healed on its own. He had nothing. I asked her because uh, she said they didn't want to release him from the hospital too. She said because they were trying to figure out, they called in a bunch of specialists because there was no, she said, uh, I said, couldn't they give him a, a hip replacement type deal? She said, well, she said the problem with that was that there was no bone left to attach the hip attachments to. She said, there's nothing there. <laughs> and then she says, his hip healed on its own. God operated on this guy. He gave him a new hip. Oh, my gosh. 
She said, uh, um, but not short of a miracle. He has no pain whatsoever. Now, the scripture that I kept praying every single time that he came to my mind um, throughout the days after that accident, I was praying Ezekiel 37, 7, and it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And I would say that probably three, four times a day, every single time that I thought of Jesse, you know, and, um, and it worked. So I wanted to let you know, if you want agreement in prayer for anything, for salvation, healing, restoration, freedom from fear, if you need money, favor, safety, if you have lingering pain, God says you have not because you ask not. He says, ask and your joy may be full. If you want, we can agree with you in prayer right now, or you can simply ask him yourself and believe his word. You know, we don't have any special powers or anything. What The only special powers we have is that we have the Holy Ghost living on the inside of us, and we believe God. God said he sent his word and healed. So we'll agree with you in prayer for whatever that prayer need is, and God will perform his word. It says God's word does not return void, but it accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. So I want to let the altar be open for you. And I wanted to remind you of Psalm 91, verses 14 to 16 again. God was speaking, and he said, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. And Jesse, if you're watching this at some point, I want you to know that today is the day of salvation. You might not have asked Jesus to be Lord of your life yet, but this is a good day to do it now. God gave you that second chance at life. His grace and his mercies are as, as ready to give to you today as he provided for you on that night. And I want to let you know that it behooves you that you should make Jesus the Lord of your life. Anyone that has never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, God is such a great God. He loves you so much. You need to, to ask him to be your Lord and Savior. He's a friend that sticks closer to a brother, and he'll elevate you above the problems of life so that you can face them straight on. He makes you more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus when you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. We hope this message has encouraged you in your relationship with the Lord. For more information and ministry resources, we invite you to visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca. We look forward to you joining us next time as we continue to live victoriously.